Hello, everyone, and welcome to this week's COVID Insights to Action discussion group. I'm Fred Goldstein, and uh, this week we'll be discussing getting back to work. So with that, I'll let the two physicians introduce themselves. We'll start with you, Nick. Hi, my name's Nick Van Hayden, also known as Dr. Nick. Dr. Louis Saldana here. Fantastic. Well, great. This week we're going to discuss getting back to work, which is obviously an interesting situation now that the vaccine's coming out. Um, maybe we start with a little bit of where are we with the vaccine? Maybe, uh, Nick, you can talk about that, and then we'll get into some of the things to consider for employers, et cetera, as they move forward. Well, yeah, where are we? Um, we're, we're not where we need to be, that's for sure, unfortunately. Um, we've uh, done a pretty fantastic job at uh, getting the vaccine, producing uh, pretty substantial amounts of it in terms of pre-production, getting it ready, even having distribution systems available, particularly for the cold uh, storage or super cold storage. Uh, but unfortunately, the last uh, mile, inches, whatever, into the arm is the new phrase that everybody's uh, uh, thinking about and talking about. Uh, we have not done a decent job, unfortunately. Um, we have this patchwork of implementation across different states, different counties, random uh, sort of some people showing up and waiting, others, um, you know, returning doses or being asked to return doses, others getting, um, you know, unable to get appointments. I read some horror story of a four and a half hour jaunt for some professor at a college to get and book an appointment through multiple screens uh, to be able to book for their COVID. So we're really doing a very poor job and, uh, that is, uh, you know, uh, has to be our focus. This is, this is not a vaccine problem. This is a logistics um, a and flow uh, problem. And it's something that, you know, we ought to be able to solve and should do so quickly. But uh, I think it needs a little bit of uh, uh, oversight and leadership from above. Mm -hmm. So I guess as we think about this and uh, employers coming back to work right now, there's really not a big change as you look at that from what we're doing currently, which is wear a mask, you've got people working from home, et cetera, social distancing, looking at your air handling, et cetera. But over time, as more people get vaccinated, there may be some opportunities to shift that. Is that, is that sort of how we should look at it? I, I would just uh, push back a little and say, I, it's not that it's different, but I've said this a number of times now, we need to double down on all of those things, mainly because of this new variant that is uh, emerging, that is uh, more transmissible ultimately. We don't think it's more lethal, but it's uh, spreading faster. And that requires us to do all the things that we know work just better and more consistently and throughout the whole population without people going, I'm not gonna bother doing this because I don't need to. Yeah, I think that's yeah, a good I think, point. Uh, Go ahead, Louise. Yeah, I was, I was going to say, I, I, I think here we're looking, we're now looking at kind of two different curves, the, cur the curve for, for vaccination gain, gain, you know, we're going from vaccine to vaccination, and, and then the, the, the race of the case hospitalization and death numbers, which, which are at, at, at an all-time high and continue go higher and so clearly we're losing the race if you're looking at the immunization to get to get there on that i think it is interesting to point out israel on this because israel has over 20 percent of their population now vaccinated and i think the percentage of like over 70 year olds is like astoundingly high it's well above 80 percent i think it's like 80 percent or something so and and they're also in the midst of kind of that curve so it's gonna be really interesting to watch when those curves kind of intersect and see if it actually will push that number down a, a big concern of all public health uh, experts is the the fact that that it, it is going it's so so much of a wildfire that that's why we're seeing all these mutation and variants kind of accelerate and, and such. And so I think that puts us in a really tough position. Uh, and then you just put on top of it all the challenges we've had with vaccination. You could say that we had a public health failure in terms of getting the these interventions, masking, uh, distancing, all, all those things has, has kind of been a, been a bit of a failure. 
And now we're seeing the vaccination the same way. The promising thing is, as we were just saying, is there is going to be a new new sheriff in town. So we'll see if, you know, if there may be a reason for hope. But the biggest thing is there actually will be somebody, there will actually be a, quote, czar or vaccine czar, somebody that actually is in charge. Right now, there's not a, a accountable person. And I think we really need to have that accountable person to do that and really pull out all the stops and look at, you know, production, distribution, storage, uh, and then the the final mile logistics. I think all of those things are, are are kind of important. So hopefully we can really accelerate those rates right now uh, for employees. As far as I see, employers and employees right now, you you're just trying to keep from getting infected. I think is, is probably our our single biggest task. And and then uh, you know and then getting the vaccine when it when when you can. Yeah, and I think you know right on target. Getting back to Nick's point. I was looking at it through my own lens where I'm really tightly locked down and, you know, trying to follow all the things and watching my indoor activities, et cetera. But you're right. The, the virus is so taken off now because we haven't been doing that effectively. And as you pointed out, we do need to double down on that and get everyone to recognize now is the time to really double down on that. And it'll be interesting to watch the Israel example because I know they started at the elderly and then worked the ages down. And so you may begin to see early on drop in death rates which is what they're hoping for, um, as you talked about, Louise. So uh, a fascinating thing from that. And it'll also be interesting to see how they then pivot this at what point to begin to reopen and go to work and mm -hmm. do some of those things yeah. and see, because they're going so rapidly ahead of the rest of us, they can yeah. provide us with some insights on what we could yeah. potentially do or what maybe we don't want to do because something's been changed and reopened that might not be as effective. So that'll be something interesting to watch from an employer perspective as well. And I would say, I'd do one other thing and just go and say, what the hell are you doing? And just copy that. <laughs> so, you know, it was fascinating. I've looked into it a little bit. They have four national health plans. You choose one of the four and they told the health plans, it's your job to distribute these to your members. You have electronic health records on all of them with both of you are experts in, you know, and they're effectively and efficiently identifying those people and through that plan, getting them the shots. So really an interesting use of technology and approach. I, I you know, and, and Luis brought this up earlier when we were talking uh, separately, and I think this is a really interesting point. You know, we've got all these electronic health records, but people are talking about sequencing of who gets their vaccination, and there is no use of the electronic health record. It's fill in a form. I, I'm, I am waiting for the facts. Uh, you know, I'm going to walk into a vaccine place and I'm going to get the five page form. I, I, how preposterous is that? When did we introduce electronic medical records and we still can't use it? For something <laughs> as basic as this? <laughs> and, and how many times have you seen the pictures of the piece of paper that says you got the first one? <laughs> You know that you're going to carry around with I you. Still, I, I still have mine, so I, <laughs> yeah. I, 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 I got to store that that baby for now because until, until you know I have a way to to, to digi digitize it, I have to hold on to mine until I get my my second uh, my second second vaccine. So so yeah, I, I definitely and again another failure that probably doesn't get pointed out was the failure of technology to really uh, in, enable. Or, or execute on on this on both the like we said prioritization and then also you know the things that will be important to employers and things is how will we prove that we've been vaccinated with that this kind of uh, I guess what do they call it uh, uh, you know vaccine pass or or health pass of some sort that is going to basically be your passport in to kind of say I've I've had this so. So I, I, I'm, I'm OK to, to, to do to, you know, to, for these activities. Right. And just like we've seen with the rest of healthcare, we have completely created multiple versions of it. So how many different vaccine passports will there be to show? Well, I'm using the one from Google. I got the one from Apple. I got the one from my local health plan. I've got the paper one. You know, I'm wondering, Luis, um, I, I don't know when. Can you take your form and run it through a fax machine to send it in for your vaccine? <laughs> yeah, that's that's still the rely. You know, the, the, there's a lot of reliance still on on fax machines. So de definitely, you see that there's not there isn't currently a standard for 
getting it into Apple Health. People are taking pictures of theirs and, and having some record. And I guess you can find a way to have it stored in Apple Health or, or something like that. But there needs to be a standard. Uh, you yeah. know, we need to have uh, standards for for that, as as we said, said that that are that are transferable. How, how do we know it's verified and valid? Right. And if you think about that from an employer perspective, I know I've seen some things about people already faking those. Yep. And so, you know, you're an employer. They walk up with this. How do you know that one's real? It's just a, an interesting question that people have to deal with. So one of the other issues I think that's it's fascinating is. It's clear that work at home is going to continue for a lot of folks. You know, companies are deciding not to have people come back to the offices. Um, some, I know, I know REI actually built this beautiful big headquarters out in Seattle that was just brand new and sold it. Uh, and so you then get these issues around employee health and how do you help those employees with their health when they're at home? And what are the issues that are raised? We're seeing a lot of issues around mental health, anxiety, stress, depression, because of some of this and the lack of interactions. So that's clearly something that employees are going to have to think about or employers are going to have to think about going forward uh, through this, even with or without a vaccine. Yeah, I, I think it's just accelerated the need for better monitoring at home and the capacity to push out clinical uh, capabilities into the home setting so that we can monitor. I mean, we've seen a number of companies emerge that sort of talk about COVID monitoring. In fact, uh, one of my uh, compatriots from the NHS uh, developed a sort of home health, home hospital monitoring system for COVID-19 patients tied around temperature, pulse ox, um, you know, some devices that essentially allowed them to uh, safely monitor individuals. But I would, I, I would imagine we'll see more of that um, in terms of the monitoring and capabilities so that we can provide more of that oversight and then deal with the exceptions as opposed to having to sort of check in with everybody um, you know, manually. Mm -hmm. And we're also seeing this rapid uptake of telehealth you know, visits, you know, doctor visits, et cetera, done via technology like Zoom or, or these others. Um, and I would assume that's going to continue a, as we move forward, which may create, you know, employers need to be sure that as they look at their plans, they have these kind of options available for their employees to be able to access care through their, their whoever they're, whether they're self-insured or going through a payer, that they've set those things up. And, and I would guess use them as broadly as clinically feasible without going too far and trying to telehealth visit certain things that obviously it wouldn't work for. Right. I, and, you know, back to the original point of electronic medical records, making sure that that information is tied back into a repository that, uh, you know, the prevailing physician of record can actually see as opposed to some random individual that they happen to consult that was in Alaska and was awake at the time that they had a question. Um, you know, I, I'm a little bit concerned about the coordination of all of that and the sharing of information. Now, I'm, I, I don't know what they have set up, but certainly my personal experience has been, it sits out on its own. It's another island of information. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I'm gonna point out something, else, kind of another piece of this, and that goes to the work at home or, or you know, work from home or remote work and, and telehealth. And all that thing is that I, I, I always point this out. I think it's we're in a critical time for mental health as well. Is it's you know it, is it different when you see somebody around the water cooler, somebody in the office, versus somebody on a Zoom call, and you you don't know how they're doing at home. And you know you don't know what their support system is like. Uh, yeah, so so I think that that that's an area that is going to need even more attention and almost be looked at proactively. How do we evaluate and assess these social situations? I, I identify pe folks that are at risk. At, at home, uh, maybe it's, maybe it is productivity. Maybe it's they're not showing up or whatever it is. I think that that's going to be kind of an important part of this, and I think probably gets you know short shift on on a lot of the efforts for you know kind of moving towards towards telehealth and and work from home and things like that. It it, it saves employers money. 
for people to be work from home. I mean, obviously not right now. They're paying for a rent for a big building, an office building that's empty. Nobody wants to have that. But if you eliminate that part of it, it's a it's a cost savings for for employers. So it would be uh, excellent if some of that could be applied back to employees and their overall maintaining their overall health, looking at their work setup, you know, some evaluation assessment of their work setup from home, uh, how they're doing on a day-to-day basis, a check, some kind of a check-in. Ha- have some maybe there's a regular person they check in with, uh, you know, for mental health, uh, uh, you know, that type of thing. So. So I just want to raise that because I think it, it, it it's an important point that often gets 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 or it's easy to overlook. It's I, great- I think it's a, a great idea. It it reminds me of some of the companies that tried to sort of handle the whole uh, supplies issue, staples, post-its, all of those things that you know they had centralized stores, and some brave companies said we're going to stop providing this for our employees in the office setting. We're going to give you a fifty dollar uh, allowance for your supplies, and they saved gargantuan amounts of money because now suddenly there was some personal responsibility and shared whatever. And I think you know, same principle applies here. If you get uh, get some savings, apply them back to give people some you know positive reinforcement. It also raises a really another interesting issue, Luis. I'm glad you brought this up. If you think about it, a typical employee health improvement program does an HRA at the beginning of the year and some lab and biometrics. And they use that to identify the risks in their population and say, well, these people are struggling with this. And you may do a a PHQ-9, which is, you know, a depression screening or something like that. But given all of the stress of working at home, we probably need to adjust our assessment tools and frequency and say to ourselves, you know, we should be asking, is there a child at home who's being homeschooled? You know, is your other, is your significant, other or spouse or partner also working from home and those kinds of things that may impact it and then do a more frequent assessment like you said maybe it's a daily little check-in off an app as you mentioned Luis, or something like that to begin to identify those people and then the question becomes okay now that we've identified and assessed this population how do we go ahead and apply resources to them you've got eap services you have mental health you have telehealth but they all need to be amped up it's that whole double down thing you talked about from a perspective of keeping us healthy it now becomes double down on identifying and engaging and intervening to help these individuals maintain their health in a completely new environment from a work perspective. I, I, I would even go a bit further than that and say, and I, and I don't want to be big brother here, but I've talked about for a number of years, the capacity to use camera tracking of individuals. You could incorporate that into Zoom And you can get a really good sense of somebody's mood based on their visual expressions, engagement, you know, all of those things that you could almost sort of do as a passive. Now, I wouldn't want to see that used pejoratively, but wow, wouldn't it be great to actually do some surveillance and start to understand and, you know, place an intervention on some of that? Mm -hmm. Yeah. It, it, obviously, there are some issues around the privacy and stuff like that that come up from an employer perspective, but you're seeing some of that newer technology also as you look at in the elderly with some of these in-home systems mm-hmm. that are looking at how often they're walking through a space. Are they getting out of bed at the same time? I mean, you can really get some detailed information around an individual and the, in, and the issues they're dealing with or potentially dealing with by, by tracking some of that. But I think an early step would be really taking a strong look at your company's benefits package around mental health, service delivery around mental health, and also how you're determining who may be struggling. And and those type of assessment tools would be really useful going forward uh, to ensure that your employees are as healthy as they can be and functioning at the highest level they can. I think that's exactly right. I think the support systems for this need to be, for work, work from home world need to be rethought out i mean what what worked for in person it may not be the what works now or, or going forward uh certainly people played sometimes they paid for gym memberships maybe now you pay for a peloton or you know, yeah or whatever yeah yeah so there, uh, there there's a lot of aspects to 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 look at as far as far as that goes so so it, it's an area that i don't think has really gotten in, gotten enough 
enough attention. I think it's this is going to be a good time for us to reevaluate all the things around work, and that's coming back to the office, whether it's you, know, you come back one or two days a week or you work totally remotely. Those type mm-hmm. of decisions, I think, are all going to be big. Right. I'm thinking of this also from the perspective of, well, when we used to go into the office and we would do a lunchtime walk or we would have, you know, the healthy lunchroom and you now don't have that opportunity. And so the question becomes, can you, like you said, go in with with Pelotons or something like that, create that environment? But also we know it's safer outdoors than indoors. So are there ways to create some of your work activities and use that space like that in a safe distance masked social manner to uh, at least have more interaction than we tend to have over this yeah. type of uh, technology. Right. Yeah. I, yeah. And I'll, I'll, I'll say one thing. I think we all have been kind of victims of the, the me death by meeting, you know, but, and, and I think a part of it is the way they've been structured. So maybe now they need to change the structure. Maybe we need to have, Okay, what kind of meeting is this? Is this, this is a Zoom or this is a a walking meeting? I'm I'm ta- I'm walking. You're walking. You have one on one. You're both walking or something like that out outdoors if, if if that's possible. And also, you know, does that have to be a new to me? It has to be an hour. Is thirty minutes adequate? You know, I think all those things need to really re- be rethought for for kind of this new this new working world. Uh, you know, as we get into it. So. Mm-hmm. Yeah, and, and uh, the, the mental health aspect. And then you have the other issue that's going on is, um, you know, we've typically as an employer wor- uh, health improvement organization tried to ensure that individuals get appropriate screenings as P- per PTSD, you know, the um, US PTSF guidelines and things like that. And so now you have a lot of people who are either s- afraid to go to their physician's offices or missing that thing, et cetera. And so how do you then create that kind of an environment to help your employees get those things that they should be getting tested and looked at, et cetera? Maybe there's some yeah. ways to incent that or, or, or provide those services in a different manner. Yeah, the long COVID, and you talk about the people that are gonna have long COVID, uh, you know, the ongoing symptoms after that, and also P- PTSD for whatever reason, you're hospitalized or you've just had prolonged symptoms. All those things can cause, you know, big PTSD symptoms and things. Those those, those are, are going to be important considerations, you know, as well. Mm-hmm. So are there any other areas you think of that employees should be thinking, employers should be thinking about in terms of um monitoring or looking at how they can get access to vaccines, how they can help individuals potentially with that? Is that something they should be looking into for their employees? Well, I think they're inevitably going to be getting questions. I mean, that's, Mm -hmm. you know, part of the sort of employee employer relationship. Is that going to be a requirement to come back to work? Those are, you know, legal questions that, you know, I don't feel qualified to answer, but I think businesses are going to have to start thinking about, is that a, you know, no, you can't enter shops without a T-shirt and uh, shoes. So does that now include a vaccination? I mean, I, I'm, you know, I don't use that entirely flippantly. Um, and then, you know, how do you validate that somebody has? What vaccines are available when, you know, and how do you sort of, if, if you're low down on the priority list, which is outside of your control, that's, you know, essentially coming down from uh, the at least the federal or the state authorities, what happens to the people that can't have access? Are they specifically excluded? Is there some alternative? You know, this, this is all sort of a pretty complex area of health and health management uh, that's going to require significant help. And, um, you know, that's areas of specialism that I know you've focused on. And, you know, one of the things that we certainly think about offering from uh, our, our services. Mm-hmm. Yeah, I will also say I, I think it, it, it's it, it's kind of sad to see that right now we're in this point of vaccination where it, it's 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 a it's a really d- deeply constrained resource. Uh, so that's driving this prioritization, this kind of elbowing out who who gets it, who doesn't get it, this type of thing. 
that's a failure because what we should have is there's enough out there for everybody. We have these things solved. It's how do we get it out fast enough for everybody? I think that, that how, making that transition where it's it's not we're not constrained by that resource. The resource constraint should be me. You know, we worry about vaccine hesitancy. Well, we're not even at that point right now. There's people that want it that can't get it. We right. want to be at the point that I can get it anytime. I go online and I sign up. I don't. I don't care what priority you're, you're in. We need to get it in, in in all these arms. I mean, that's that's the key. And I've seen that starting to get message from that because I think there's been a lot of elbowing out for because it has been so short that we've wasted time. Doses get wasted because they're scared. If I don't give if if I don't give these doses, I won't get in trouble with with giving it to somebody that doesn't deserve it. Would have these doses left. Mm-hmm. Just just give them. I mean, you know what I'm saying right. I, I I I will I will praise the day that we see that that point that we don't have to be worried about that. That that will be a that will be a real landmark day for for the United States to me. Mm-hmm. Yeah, and I think you know as you mentioned earlier, we may see in the come with the coming administration a little more of a focus on how we logistically get this thing done and and standardize a little bit so like we were talking about earlier. You know, we've got five counties around me, six of them, and every one of them is doing it differently. And that's so confusing for the individuals who are trying to get vaccinated to try and figure out, well, does this one I have to call? That one I have to, you know, go online. This one is doing people in Florida and outside of Florida. This one is not. So uh, hopefully we can standardize some of that. And then, you know, as rapidly as we can get this into individuals so we can then begin to look at how do we reopen various things in the future. And I think the thing that, you know, I wonder, I don't know what the answer is in Israel, because you've talked about that up front in terms of their uh, rollout. Did they also cover the funding as part of that, you know, attribution to the four uh, health insurers or whatever? Right. Because you can't do this with fresh air and it's difficult. Um And if you're not sort of taking account of that, then, you know, you just run into problems. We, we know how to do this. We just have to follow through and make this happen. Mm-hmm. So I guess if we think about this from an employer perspective, they need to really take a look at what their benefit systems are, what kind of package they have, what they plan to do in the future from an operational perspective, and then what sort of things they need to put in place to assess their employees from the various issues that they'll face working at home or coming to an office or, or a combination and then put in additional programs, whether it's around mental health or some of these other areas to meet those needs. Right. Yeah. Yeah. Great. Yeah. Great. Well, it really makes, it, you know, it makes a lot of sense. And I think, you know, as employers consider this, you know, we're obviously here to help think this through from a medical operational employee health improvement perspective. And I think, um, you know, please feel free to reach out to us. We'd be happy to talk to anybody about this. And um, obviously there are things we can do better and help. We've been helping some companies so far work through this and get themselves going. And, and now I think the vaccine's great news is you've all talked about, it, it's amazing that it's come out this quickly. Right. Now it's a matter of, it's sort of what you would think was the easy stuff, which is getting it into somebody's arm versus the science it takes to then to develop that thing and test it and run those uh, phase three trials to get it out. So we're in an interesting transition point and hopefully we can, as you said, Luis, get the vaccine out ahead of the, of the spike to see this baby go the other way. Right. Yeah. Any other comments you want to make before we finish up here? No, I uh, think... Um, yeah. critical time and we need to focus on getting vaccines yeah. in arms to Luis's point there should not be a single drop of that stuff wasted at any point in time if it's available put it in yeah and I'll still say you know with as, as, as where the numbers are now we really need to really be uh, much more thoughtful about these non-pharmaceutical interventions and masks and distancing reduce you for God's sakes we need to re- each reduce our total context per day to the to the bare minimum we should need to think through how do i plan my day how many people am i going to come in contact with is there some that i don't need to absolutely don't need to to do that keep it come in contact with i think we one thing we saw of the holidays is these things that could have probably been put off 
uh, we we all wanted to be with family you know and it ended up cost having a big cost to it and things as well so so uh uh please you know wear masks they are effective we've seen more we we so we we're talking about a study on double masks and things mm -hmm. in some situations it might be a good idea uh so so anyway that all that, that's all i want to say yeah i think a fantastic end to today and thanks so much for joining us everyone if you'd like more information, you can find it at valighealth.com. And um, we're happy to talk to you and look forward to next week. We'll get that topic out coming up soon. Thank you.